Welcome in to Between Two Meeples. I am Armando Castaneda, and today I have with me... I am Isaac Meyer with Barmaid Games. He's joining me today. We are going to knock out our 10 gateway games and a few that I feel like I might be a little nostalgic on still. Yeah. How about you? You got uh, anything in there from your childhood? Uh, Not from childhood, but definitely some that got me into the hobby for sure. Nice. For those of you who don't know what a gateway game is, a gateway game in our mind is something that you are trying to bring somebody into the hobby that currently either a you know is not playing in the hobby or maybe mm -hmm. they like chess or you know maybe yeah. they're in some form of the hobby but just not board games. So um, the criteria that we kind of went through there's like six different things is it needs to be simple, okay? It needs to be fun, short, replayable, typically good components in the game and good for all ages. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about. That's kind of how we judged all of our games today. Mm -hmm. Is that how you judge yours? For the most part. <laughs> all right. Well, you got nothing else. Let's jump into it. Yeah, well, one other thing that I that I threw into my criteria was affordable. Oh. Um. I definitely, I'll talk about them later, but I had a couple games that, um, I'll, I'll just talk about one. Well, that segues us in, because I think that we have, I think, three games okay. that are on our nominations, that, like, we thought they both should have been in our top ten, but because of what he's saying it's cost, they didn't make it in. So, the first one? Yeah, so, I uh, Foundations of Rome, for me, would have made probably, like, my top five, yeah. but... I just can't, in a good conscience, say, hey, go get this $250 game. For um, a gateway game? For a gateway game. <laughs> um, it's worth it, you know, if, if you're into that, uh, but, you know. It was a really good game. It's it's so good. It was. I've played it so many times, but I guess uh, they're coming out with a new one, um, Foundations of Metropolis, where it will be more affordable, and then it will definitely make my list. Yeah. For those of you who don't know what Foundations of Rome is, if you've ever played Bunny Kingdom, it's uh, kind of a little bit better version of that. Yeah, I, I, that's how I always describe it to people. It's, <laughs> it's better Bunny Kingdom. Yeah, way better Bunny Kingdom. So uh, The other game that uh, was our nomination that didn't make it on there was Ticket to Ride. Yeah. Um, I That was the game that got me into the genre, so I that has some sentimental value to me. I still have three or four different versions of Ticket to Ride in my collection because I enjoy it. It was... You know, it's what got me in here. Oh, yeah. I played it with my family growing up all the time and yeah. didn't make my list because I had other ones I wanted to talk about. <laughs> now, with the game group that I'm in, it's hard to find somebody who wants to play Ticket to Ride. Yeah. But if anybody ever says, do you want to play Ticket to Ride? Yes. Like, I'm always I'm always up for a game of Ticket to Ride. Yeah, I've got, I've got some buddies that that is their favorite game of all time, and I'm always down. I'm like, <laughs> okay, yeah, it's your guys' favorite game. <laughs> We'll play it. I can just sit down and play some tickets, right? Don't even have to think about it and just have a good time. Yep. And last but not least, One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Oh, yeah. Uh, that is, uh, I'm not a real big social deduction, but that one, I had a blast every single time I played it. Yeah, I, I do really like social deduction, and <laughs> I've still found myself coming back to One Night Ultimate Werewolf countless times. I really like the app and how quick the game goes. Like yeah. the game starts and ends in eight minutes. Like yeah, it's, it's it's definitely one that should be talked about when you're talking about best gateway games. I would agree. I would agree. So, all right, we'll kick it off with one number ten that Armando's not going to be happy about. <laughs> Robot Quest Arena. <sighs> this breaks my heart. Um, <laughs> this is easily one of my become one of my favorite games to play and pull out at game night it's so easy to teach but it's at the same time there's enough depth in there in like the huge deck of cards that you're building from to keep you coming back to it um i'll just give you a quick rundown of the game it's it's just a all-out brawl where you're just you pick a robot and you're just fighting each other it's a deck building game yeah and uh, I will admit that the market deck does feel 
pretty swingy. Very swingy. But <laughs> but it's a short enough game to where I don't really care because even if you get that amazing card, you're probably only going to pull it maybe one or two times. So this I, I did a review on this the other day. You did. I did. And one of the things that like I think just pissed me off the most <laughs> is let's say somebody gets the card and then they get a second card that pairs with with it. Oh yeah. Like I shuffle my deck and it looks like I shuffle my deck. But like when somebody just goes like this and like picks off the top two cards. And I'm like, how the F are you getting the exact same two cards in your hand every single time? It just doesn't make any sense. I, like, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. So shuffle. that was for me, the play with you was my least favorite play of this. Because yeah, the person we were playing with did get this super busted combo oh, and just mopped the board. And, and it just felt like no matter how we shuffled it... The every other play, <laughs> though, that I've had in this game has been a blast. Yeah. And if you just want to play a game where you're beating the crap out of your friends um, for, like, 40 minutes... This, it's It would have been fun. Yeah. We'll have to play it again. <laughs> um, I, I will play it again. Okay. So It's not on my never play again list, but I, I will yeah. play it again. Robot question right us. That's my number 10. <laughs> All right. My number 10 is nothing like that one but it also is a deck building game and we're going to go with the quest for el dorado so this is actually more of a racing game uh, where you are starting at one end of the board and you have to basically construct a deck whatever cards you pull you get to race through the jungle to make it to el dorado and one of the greatest things about this one is it gets very simple. Like the iconography mm -hmm. on the cards, there's only like three, three or four things that you can do. It's either like you're going on water, you're going on uh, the desert, you're going on the grass. Like there's not very many options. So like as far as like the depth of the game goes, um, you can really teach this to so many age groups. Like my kids love this thing. And uh, you can make it as easy, as hard as you want. You can put, you know, the map can be three boards short, which would take you about 20 minutes long to get through. Or you can make it like they've used every board in the game and it's taken us like, you know, 65 minutes to get through a game oh, wow. because we've got to go through the whole entire board to get there. So, uh, the El Dorado, this is one of the ones that I enjoy the most. Like when it comes to race games, like I think this is one of my favorite race games and it does have that deck building uh, in there. It does have the market, so you do still have to go buy cards mm -hmm. and there's a little bit of stuff to it. So, have you played it? Not played. This is one of those games that I'm like sad oh. that I've never played. It is a um, great game. Yeah, it's. I've got a few games that I just have never got around to. Yeah, and this is one of those those games. Number nine. So my number nine is what I would consider like the quintessential tile placement game. Oh, I don't know. I have a lot um, of tile placement games. I I would say that this game right here is like if you haven't played this game, you need to. And that's King Domino. Um, is this like Carcassonne? I, I've never played King Domino, and that's because I suck at life. And every time I've tried to play it, I, for some reason... It takes 15 minutes, maybe 10. <laughs> 10 if everyone knows what's going on. I well, we should have played it before the video. And then another, <laughs> another couple minutes to score it. But I don't really know what I can say about this game that hasn't been said by other reviewers. It's just, it's so good. It's so easy to teach, so so easy to play, and I just have a great time is every time. Every time I play it, is it like Carcassonne? No, it's uh, basically you're putting out these tiles, and they all have a um, a value to them that has been the designer decided a value, and so you're going to put them in order of their value, and then you're going to pick your tile. But when you pick your tile, that determines your order of picking next time. So if you want the best tile, you're going to pick last next round. Got it. And that's all it is. And then you place the tile in a grid, and then you're going to score your grid based on how you've placed them to match things, and there's multipliers. It's just, it's simple, good fun. So is it solo, or is it like... We're, no, we're all, we're all playing our own board. Oh, got it. Um, yeah. I like that. All right, well, let's go to my number nine. My number nine, I just got this game. He just taught me this game, mm -hmm. and I love this game now, and it is Marvel United, and I think one of the things that attracted me so much to it is because you taught me the rules. I feel like it was, what, 10 minutes or less? Oh, way less than Five that. Five minutes? Yeah. I, I, I think it took us longer to set up than it did for you to teach me the actual rules on how to play the game. Oh, yeah. So, like, 
even if you have the base game or any base boxes, like there's still enough variability within the boxes where you have what five, six, seven different characters to choose from. Yeah, I think I think the I think like the base boxes come with maybe like six heroes yeah. and like three villains. But I mean, the replayability in that is already quite a bit. Um, from from me personally, I, I'd suggest the X Men one just because the characters feel more different than in this the regular one uh i think they have like four special cards versus three in the other ones and a lot of them have this really cool thing where they have a starting hand card which basically is giving you a passive mm -hmm. ability throughout the game if um, something triggers yeah, yeah it was which really is nice yeah um but i'll let you talk about it because i'm probably going to be talking about it later <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what we have in our top 10 so let me go ahead and share my piece real quick so for the games that we played, like I think even in the gameplay with us fully knowing how to play it, what we got through two games in like 40 minutes. So mm -hmm. it, it wasn't very hard. You know, win or lose, the game still takes you about 20 minutes each game because there's not much to do. You have like, I think it's what, 12 cards in, in your deck? Yep. And all you're doing is you're playing the cards. Like we almost lost one time because we just didn't have any more punch cards. In our hand, oh. like we won. We were with we were both the very last very punch card. not fighty characters <laughs> yeah. going against a villain that needed us to be very fighty. Yeah. So like the game, there's so much strategy involved in trying to how do you get you know all these things to resolve, and then how do you go there and defeat the main character? Sometimes you just run out of cards, like it. Yeah. So even you know strategy, no strategy. You want to go in blind. You want to like how we did the first game and lost. Like, it horribly is, it is brutal <laughs> like it was still fun the whole entire time and the amount of things that you got to teach somebody is this icon means punch this green arrow means move this little star means you're a hero like you do a hero that's like that's the basic of the game i'm like that's the whole the whole game pretty yep. much but the hardest part is learn how to set it up yeah the teach was easy so that is my number nine marvel united okay for my number eight I don't think you've played this game, which is a shame. It's on the fairly newer side, but it's become one of my favorite games. Really? Um, this is Guild of Merchant Explorers. I have heard of it. And I hesitated putting this on my list because for a gateway, I think there's maybe more going on than I would say for a gateway. But then I was thinking, really, there's not. Because all this game is, is we all have a map. And we're building out from, we're all starting the same location and we're pulling cards and that determines where you get to build. You build out and one of my favorite parts in this game is once you complete an area, you get to create a village in that area. And at the end of every round, everything comes off the board except for your villages. And the next round, you get to build out from those villages. So if you don't build any villages, you're stuck. You have to go all the way back to nothing. So really, I, um, yeah, it's it's really good. But the coolest part in this game to me is there are three times in the game you get to pick these uber powerful cards um, that just separate you from everybody else at the table. And the first time, my favorite thing in this game is. What I like to do if I'm teaching the game is I will actually purposely put the, the number one card on the bottom of the deck so that people have gotten to take their actions before they have look at these cards and really know like what they want from them. Um, just in a teaching game, I'll do that sometimes. And uh, I love watching people's faces when they pull those cards and go, what? I get to place six things? Like, because everything else in the game, you're placing one or two. And then you'll get these cards that are say, you can place as many cubes as you can, as long as it's in a straight line. Huh. And you're like, what? Um, it, it's just, it's a really good game. Uh, fun to play. There's a lot of replayability in the box because there's, f I think, four different maps. Oh, um, all And at least two of those maps are like real base. And then two of them kind of add something spicy to the oh, mix. Interesting. So. It's really fun. Might have to try so, that now. That's my number eight. My number eight. Everyone already, already has probably already heard that this is a great gateway game. And I'm going to agree with them. Like I, as far as like set collection goes, as far as like what's in the box, the chips, I love having the chips in oh, my yeah. hand. Like 
Like, there's nothing better than a game that just makes me like want to play it. And chips, heavy chips in, in my hand, like, that's one of the games that, like, I can stack them, I can make noise with them, I get my, you know, my OCD starts kicking in, and I just, oh, yeah. like, I can't sit still, and I'm playing with these with this game, so. Splendor, uh, set collection game, you're basically a jewel collector, trying to collect as many jewels to be, like, uh, to turn into the nobles, and basically it's a race to 15 points, I believe, in this one. Two things. One... Splendor Duel is by far the better of all the games I personally feel because it, it is an amazing game. Like, it's so good that I almost called Splendor. But I can't call my Splendor because it is, in my mind, the better version to bring somebody into the game to because of how easy it is to teach them. But what Splendor Duel does is it puts all the chips on a board and you are like drafting chips from this board in okay. like a diagonal. So it can be very mean. Like you can go over there and you can screw some people from getting it. Uh, there's player powers inside of that thing. There's the thing that you were talking about where you can, uh, if you collect the most crowns, you get like bonuses and okay. stuff. But like, so yeah, there's three different win criterias in there. You can either get ten crowns, you can either get six of the same jewels, and or it's a race to twelve. I think in that one. So like, there's three different ways that you you can win in Splendor Duel. And it is very, very cutthroat, but it is the much better version of this one. Like we, since we've gotten dual, the only time we pull out Splendor is when somebody is coming over for a gateway or wants something okay, like. Yeah. So yeah, I uh, I got Marvel and I couldn't get rid of just my base game Splendor, so I actually gave it to my in laws because I'm like, <laughs> I I feel wrong yeah, just yeah. like getting rid of this game. I love Splendor. What are we at? Seven? No, eight. No, uh, number seven. seven. We're on seven. One, two, three. We're smoking crack. One, two, three. Ten, okay. nine, eight. We're on number seven. So my number seven is Push Your Luck. Yep. It's bag building. All Both things I really like. And by now, everyone knows what it is. I would hope so. <laughs> uh, because it's Quacks of Quedlinburg. Um, you were mad that this didn't make it to my top ten. I was mad that you didn't. Because uh, we had talked about it beforehand and... It sounded like it was easily going to make it. Ah, it. After doing my list, it slid down a little bit. It ended up at 14 for me. Okay. Point. So, like, I really enjoy it to the point to where I own the Mega Box because I like all of the expansions for it and everything. I love the game. Now, do you have upgraded I do not. bits in here? Because I do Because the upgraded bits are... Making it that much better? Oh. Well, I mean, that's what I have Wonderland's War for now. Wonderland's War is so good. I know. Not Gateway. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this uh, this game's great. Uh, it's got practically endless replayability. Uh, yes. Especially, I mean, just base game, I think, comes with Multiple like options. four of, of every color, at least yeah. four different options for each color. I think Maybe there's even a... six. Uh, it's been a long time since I had just the base game for this. It could but be eight. I don't, I don't think it's eight. I think it might be six. It's four okay. or six. But... Um, I know it's a lot of choices. Yeah. Um, one thing I like about this game is that um, you can teach people how to play it during the first round. Mm -hmm. um, just every, You just give everyone their stuff. Starting bags. And just say, we, just, we just play through the first round. I, I don't need to explain the game at all. As people pull chips, I go, okay, so that chip goes like this. And boom. And they mm -hmm. go, okay, cool. And then I go, okay, hey you're close to busting, you might want to think about not pulling something out. And they go, oh, that's an option? And I go, yeah. You just pull your hand out, show nothing, yep. and you're done for the round. For as, as much as there is going on in this game, it is so easy to teach because... It is one of the longer games. Though. It is longer. Um, yeah, uh, the first play is probably going to feel long. Um Especially if you do the ninth round, uh, same time thing that can mm -hmm. really slow the game down. I I played with one group; they wanted to do that the whole time. I'm like, you guys are crazy. No, this game's gonna take forever. Yeah, I don't. Do I, that. No way. Um, That's the one rule in the whole entire game that drives me crazy. Is, is the, the ninth round? Yeah, no, it's just the. Well, you the, you only do that any part of the game, like. They, I thought they were supposed to do it like the first round, so everyone like you teach everyone at the same time. Yeah, you can teach people that, but. Yeah. Um, no, it's great. Um, I'm pissed Armando didn't put it on his list. Uh, that's, that's close. Yeah, close, that's close. close, but not close enough. <laughs> so, yeah, Quacks. Quacks is great. I love Quacks. If you haven't played it, play it. Play it, for sure. Yeah, I'm with you. 
I had some other stuff that made it that probably is going to surprise you. Like this one. I don't so even know is, this game. See? So I have this game. It's called Reef. And I really love set collection games, I feel like. And when we talk about games with like components, this game has like nice plastic coral pieces in it. Okay. And basically it's like you're stacking. You, you have like a four by four grid. And you are stacking these coral trying to make a design. And you're drafting cards into your hand. And you can use the card one of two ways. You can either use the card to score points. Or you can use the card to get resources. That okay. is the only thing that you really do on your turn. Is either you're going to play the card to get resources. You get those resources. You put it on your board. Or you go, nope, I'm going to play this card. I have made this design. Because it because you to be like... You need four purples in a square shape, or you need, you know, a blue and a yellow right next to each other. Like mm -hmm. there, there's scoring patterns on this thing where you do it, and some of them require them to be at a two high or a three high or possibly even a four high. So kind of uh, gives me some Takenoko vibes. Uh, is that what? yeah exactly with the bamboo with the bamboo? Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly like that. And it, except for this one, is you're not growing out the board. You just you're in your own little area okay. on your own player mat trying to make your own designs with these coral reefs. And that's one of the things, like, this is one of the best games that I've found when it comes to, like, set collection, when it comes to card drafting. Uh, and it's and it's open drafting because there's four in the market that you guys are, are drawing out of. And, uh, like, I think the more you go to the left, the more money it's going to cost you to be able to get it. And so, like, there's it kind, of, kind of forces you to draw from the right Mm -hmm. or spend the cards you can have in your hand. So as far as Reef goes, like I really, really enjoyed it. If you guys haven't seen it or heard of it, um, if you like anything ocean themed, like Reef is right up there with one of the better uh, stacking, you know, like the multi-level tier games, and it's really easy to learn. Hmm. So we're going to have to get you to play it. it. Yeah, it's, it seems like a theme. What? Games we haven't played? Yeah, game, games that... <laughs> it's, it seems like... Every game that you've said that I haven't played, I, I want to play. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when you're when you're in the lighter space of Gateway and stuff like, there's a lot in that. Space. There's, it's pretty hard to, to not get me to want to play a game. Yeah. Uh, my number six is Yoxi with monsters. Mm hmm. This was close to my making it into my ten as well. It is King of Tokyo. Again, Armando has this stupid large box of every game. Sometimes uh, I just, I don't, okay, real quick tip. <laughs> if you want a game and it already has like a bunch of expansions and you look at how much the expansions are, sometimes it's a better deal to spend 20 more dollars on the big box than it is to spend it's, it's, $60 on the expansions in total. It's almost always a better deal. Yes. But that just means that you waited this long to get a copy of King of Tokyo, which is crazy to me. That is true. I, I did wait a little while to get it. Well, I mean, in all fairness, this game's old. It is pretty old. And it's a good one. It is. Um, yeah, so, so basically in this game, your big epic monsters fighting over Tokyo. Uh, on your turn, you're going to play Yahtzee. Uh, you've got numbers that are going to get you points. You've got fists that are going to deal damage to other monsters. Mm -hmm. Or you've got hearts, hearts that are going to heal you. Mm -hmm. That's it. And... Roll, try to get points, or try to knock people out. There's two ways to win. You get to 10 points, or you get to... Uh, is it 10 points? Uh, it might be 20 points. It's 20 I, thought, points. I thought you'd kill everybody. Yeah, but you can win if you get 20 points. Ah. It almost never happens. Yeah. I, I've only seen it happen maybe twice, uh, because people play this game to punch each other. Yeah, every time I've played... Every always... time I've played, I have... Because, I, you know, I'm always the one teaching the games. I don't want to be the jerk. I always <laughs> go for the points and until people start punching the crap out of me. I'm like, okay, you want to play this game? And, I, and they roll a Yahtzee on punches and knock them out. But it's a great game. Uh, it's super easy, super to, easy to teach. Yeah, very um, easy to teach. Especially if anyone's ever played Yahtzee. You just say, hey, we're playing Yahtzee with monsters. And that instantly gets them going. Yeah. Uh, you the, can add in the the power up stuff, which gets bring, crazy. Brings it up enough to where you know I want to keep coming back, even after playing it so many times. And 
the the cards with the abilities and stuff on them are really fun. Yeah, really good. Oh, armor. that's the other thing. You can roll energy. Yes. To, to get to buy cards. I knew there was something else. Yes, I, um, I believe you. I thought we said it, but I believe you. Yeah, but King Tokyo. Uh, it's a great game. Still a great game. Years and years later. All right, I think this is the one that you didn't have on your list because you've played it too much. You I I have played this game too many times. I I think it's a great game. So there's nothing more than open drafting, rolling a lot, a bunch of dice with multiple colors. You pull them out of a bag, you roll the dice, and whatever number they land on, uh, you go into this open drafting phase, and you're just basically trying to make the most beautiful painted glass. And uh, as far as like ease of games go to try to get somebody into the genre, like this was probably one of the easiest games to teach, to to even learn. Like I don't think the rules were that hard to grasp. If you've no. never taught a game before, like you can come into this thing and it's really, really easy. Um, the only thing that you really need is a dice tray because these things go all over the place if you yeah. play with kids or anything like I, that. I will, I will say something about that maybe we didn't talk about about the gateway genre is that... You know, I think another thing that is important is how easy is it to teach for somebody that doesn't teach a lot of games? Yeah. Um, because, you know, people that play games all the time, it, it, it is a skill that you get better at. Over. Um, yeah. Talking. Just talking te teaching talking. games is, is something you do get better at by playing games. And yeah, like Sagrada, I, I think most of the games that we've talked about today are one of those games that you can read through the rule book mm -hmm. and have a good enough grasp to tell other people what's going on, yeah. even if you don't play games. All you the don't time. need like a 30 minute how to play video yeah. or anything. It's like super simple. You can get and into it. I, I'd say probably most of these games do have a Rodney Smith, how to play video. <laughs> uh, yeah. And still one of the best ones out there, but that's Sagrada, like in a nutshell, like I really do love it. I've played it with my teenagers and they love it. I played it with all my family. Uh, there, there hasn't been a time. One of the things that we haven't talked about too a lot is like replayability. Sagrada is one that comes with, I think that has like three or four different expansions out there mm -hmm. for it as well. So like the replayability for this thing just keeps going and going and going. And then if you like this one, they just came out with the legacy version of it as well. So like they continue to build on the world of Sagrada of your glass building and they've done a great job at it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's solid. A lot of options out there for Sagrada fans. Number five for me is a game that he's never played. Uh, another surprise to me. Um, Shock face. It is a a bidding set collection game that oh. has one of my favorite mechanics, which is you get to upgrade what you're bidding with, and the game is Knit of Alir. Okay. I make it a point to not play games I can't say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If there's a game that you can't say that yeah. you should play, it's Knit of Valir. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically the, the part of this game that is very easy for people to pick up is you are trying to... You're getting these dwarves, and there's five colors. All of the colors score differently, and you get these awesome, crazy ones... If you get one of every color, you hmm. get to get this crazy one that's either going to be, it basically counts as like three red cards, or you get one that is, if you get five of these things, you get 135 points. If you get all five of these things, which I, I, don't, I don't know how anyone could ever get all those. That would be crazy. It'd be crazy. Um, but the, the cool part of this game is for where there's three taverns each of which have cards. So we know all the cards that are available to us for the round. Then we have five coins. We are picking, we're putting coins face down on these taverns on our own little board. And then we're all, when we're all ready, we're all going to flip the first one. The highest number gets to go first. I also think this game has one of the coolest tiebreakers in any game ever. And that is when we tie, we have these little gems that were dealt randomly at the start of the game. But they're going to be swapping throughout the whole game. So if I have the higher gem, mm -hmm. I get to go first. What? And then we swap gems if we're tied. So now you have the highest gem. Because you lost next, the last tie. Next time. So you're always breaking ties with these gems because ties happen a lot in this game. Makes sense. Um, but so we're all going to flip that. Highest coin gets to go first. But it has this really cool mechanic where you have a zero coin. 
And if you play a zero, you're obviously going to get to go last. But you have two coins left over, and they're going to combine and create an even better coin. And there's this push and pull of, do I really, which, which one of these am I okay losing so that I get to upgrade my coins? Hmm. And it's a really fun push and pull uh, of this game to upgrade those coins because those coins are all worth points at the end of the game. You oh, add yeah. up all your coins. And we might have to try this one. It's it's amazing. Um, uh, it's a game that I've... Nidavellir. I've played this game. This is one of the games that I think has come off my shelf the most because it does... It is a game I can teach to people that don't play games, but it's also a game that has enough... There's, there's a little bit of meanness in I know that you need this card, so I'm going to put my <laughs> highest coin so that you don't get it. Um, I think or, that's one of the things that I know for a fact that I tried not to put in my gateway games. Meanness? Yeah. Uh, you can definitely play this without meanness. Like, yeah. uh, Especially people that haven't played it probably aren't thinking about... You, yeah. you, when you play it for your first time, you're just thinking about your own cards. You're not thinking about anybody you're not, else. But when you play it a bunch of times, you're like, okay, yeah. they need a red. Makes sense. Here, Here's my highest coin. You don't get it. Makes so. sense. Nina Valir. It's a great game. Obviously, uh... It's got the Dice Tower Seal of Excellence, so somebody over there thinks it's great as well. So, All right. Another one. Maybe you've played it? Another one I have wow. played. Wow. All right. I know. So mine, Lanterns Harvest Festival. So this game is a super simple game. It's a tile placement game. And if you can, you can't really see on the front side. Maybe I'll flip it around so you can see. Or maybe, you know what? Let's You're going to open it. I'm going to open this thing because it's, it's not that big. There's like... There's these tiles that are in here. So you can see these little tiles. And this is what you're laying down and you're playing. And basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to align colors. And if you align colors, you get bonus cards. And basically all you're trying to do is just collect these cards and turn them in for points. So you're either going to have like four of a kind. You're going to have to have one of each card. Or you're going to have like uh, three sets of two is how you get it. And it's basically a race because the first person to turn in those sets gets the highest point value and then the point value starts dramatically going Got down it. every single time somebody turns one in well the cool thing about this is is that not only do you get bonuses for placements when the colors match but you also get like now if i place this here i would get a white card you would get like an orange card because you are to the left of me Got it. so like you're not only am i playing to give me cards but you will your little chip or your little tile will be giving your opponent's cards as well. So like I might be sitting there struggling, like I need one card, and then all of a sudden you just came in and played this. I'm like, oh, now I get to turn it in. So like mm -hmm. you might feed me the cards that I need, and I might beat you to the punch to turn things in. So it really makes you think about like, what are you giving me? Everything is common knowledge for everyone, so you can see how many well, cards that they have. It's funny because you're just talking about how you strayed away from meanness, but this what? sounds like a game I could be <laughs> really mean in. Well, it's not that you're trying to be mean because sometimes like I have no choice. Either like I have to go get the cards that I need and mm -hmm. give you something, or am I going to try to be mean to you and not give it to you, but then I'm just going to get a card that I can't use. Yeah. So like not all the times you're going to be able to have that choice of am I going to be able to get what I want and be mean at the same, yeah. same time. So it's uh, it is one of those games that I really enjoy. And my wife really enjoys. It's super easy to teach. It plays up to four players, and the games don't last more than like twenty five minutes. Mm -hmm. Like if you if you know how to play this thing, we can get me and her can you know pump out like three games in an hour. It is super fast, super easy, and very fun to be able to play through. So that is Lanterns. Um, I just called Lanterns Dice. So if you're out there, don't get the dice game. That said it was re-implemented by that one. They were trying to make it like a roll and write better. It did not make it better. Okay. Another one I need to play. Yes. Number four for me is going to be a game that I don't think you see on many lists, but it has a special place in my heart. Ooh. It is, it is dark. It is gloomy, kind of, but it's one of my favorite cooperative games. And that is Subterra. Oh, you keep telling me about this. I love this game so much. Um, I don't know that there's a single game in my collection I've played more times than I've played Subterra. Really? I 
I honestly am not sure if I've played any game more than I've played this. Hmm. Um, and that's not necessarily by my choice. This just happens <laughs> to be almost everyone I know's favorite game. Because when we play this game, so what this game is, is it's, we all were explorers and we fell through a hole into a cave and we're trying to get out. Okay. It's a tile placement game and the exit to the cave is in one of the bottom five tiles. So you have to explore a lot of cave before you even come close. So the only way to explore fast enough is to split up because if you take too long you'll lose okay. because there's a timer deck and once that gets to the bottom you have to roll a skill check every turn before you get to take an action and if you fail you're out what but but that's at the very end of the game okay so your goal is to have found the exit before that happens <laughs> but if you don't you still have a chance i've seen uh, one of my favorite experiences was with this game was this guy, there's these, uh, we call them slides. And what it is, is there's this tile that when you flip it, it, if you explored it, you have to go down and you can't get back up. You're just stuck in the bottom floor? Yeah. Or you have to build, you have to try to build a rope, but building a rope is difficult. It costs you like your whole turn and you can fail. <laughs> oh, Lord. So they decided, eh, it's fine. I'll just keep going this way. Maybe I'll meet up with you guys. They found another slide. <laughs> they found all three slides in the whole deck of tiles. And they were off by themselves. And they eventually were able to come back around. We had all escaped. And they had they were rolling skill checks. And they just got to keep coming, keep coming. And they died right outside the exit. <laughs> the tile before it, they couldn't make it to the end. It, it's just, it's amazing. There's... I have every expansion for it, and there's there's a bunch of different game modes and stuff, but it's a game that just keeps me coming back. Hmm. It's it's just a blast. I will play. have to try. I do like co-op games. This this is it's this might be my favorite co-op game, but I don't think it is my favorite co-op for a um, gateway. Just because oh. I think there's there's a game that does gateway co-op better than this, but. This might be just my favorite co-op game. All right. right here. Number four. Okay. That's where we're at? Yeah. Right? Okay. Some people are going to think I'm crazy, but I think the crew should be in the gateway games. And we kind of had a brief discussion earlier about trick-taking and it being difficult to teach. It. If, but spades never played i know but i grew up playing spades so like trick taking has always been really easy so like if you've ever played any other trick taking game oh yeah in the whole entire world like it should be easy to pick up the crew and go and they're both very different games like everyone's gonna say that mission deep sea is better and as far as your replayability goes like i think i would agree just for your, your spontaneity you can make it you can adjust it but I really think, like, as far as the gateway goes, like, jumping into Quest for Planet Nine, because it structured it to very easy. Like, your first, like, what, 10, 12 was super easy. Like, it was, I, I think we were like, oh, this was, this game is. Yeah, I mean, like, but it teaches honestly, you how you, to you do tricks. You could skip, like, the first five missions. You, well, I mean, but if you don't know how to do trick taking. If you don't know how to play trick taking, yeah, do them. Yeah. But, like, the, the, the first few feel pretty trivial if you've played trick taking true very true but i really love this like i think i've had over 100 plays of the crew or more like i take this game camping i take this game like everywhere because it's such a small box it fits into everything uh it does have a two-player variant that is okay it's like playing with like a dummy uh, me and the wife have played the two-player variant but it is better at a three-player game i don't think i've ever done the two-player really yeah, we, we've done it because, like I said, we take it uh, on travel with us as well. So, like, when we're at Phoenix, we're down there. Uh, I'll take the crew and we'll play the crap out of this because we do like trick-taking games. Mm -hmm. So, the crew. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a good one. You wouldn't put it on there? Uh, no, I, it was it made my short list. Did it? But uh, I think trick-taking it is it's one of those things in, in designing. Um, I, I designed a trick-taking game in when I was trying to write the rule book I realized just how difficult 
trick taking is to explain. Yeah. From a just understanding, like trying to write a rule book for a trick taking game to where you know exactly what trick taking is, is actually it's really complex for such a simple system. Have you played Fox in the Forest? Yeah. That that so that trick taking game like pissed me off so bad because of the stupid player powers. Oh, I love on the Fox. cards. I love Fox and Forest. Do you? Yes. Like that, the number nine card on that thing just pissed me off. Like uh, you can play a nine and just automatically win. You're like, what the hell? Like, how did I just? Fox and the Forest is great for a two player game. Ah, I I but... would still prefer this one at a two player game for trick taking. But I. No, I do think these are great games, especially if you've got a group that has played hearts or spades before. Yeah. Um, they're they're going to come into this no. knowing exactly what's up, and they're going to have a great time. Yes. Um, so for any of those card players you have out there, like the crew is definitely one of those games that you want to go and try to bring in mm-hmm. and get their attention because it is great. Like it yeah. hooked me. Well, we've gotten to the point in my list where it's a weird one that top three is weird. You're getting weird now in the top three? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's one of the best games I've ever played. And it's a game that everyone has asked to play a second time immediately after we finished. And so it's a dexterity game. Okay. It is area control. Interesting. It is player powers. And it is chaos. In a dexterity game? Yes. Interesting. This game is called... Flick of Faith. Never heard of it. <laughs> I, I I didn't think you would have. Uh, this is a game that I, I've never seen on somebody else's shelf other than mine, except for the one guy that played it at my house and immediately bought a copy. Um, it's by Awaken Realms Light. Um, but the game is, you know, I'm actually going to pull, I'm going to pull this one out because I think, I think people need to see this game. Okay. So here's the mat, which is pretty awesome. You've got this big neoprene mat. And the way the game works is we all have a cloud that we have to shoot from. And basically we're going to be flicking our guys trying to either control these areas, get points by landing in the middle, kind of like Crokinole, okay. or build temples by landing in one of these cities. Um. It's got these big, chunky pieces. Is that what you're hitting? No, so you're flicking these guys, right? Oh, they're just little guys. They're just little guys. They're but little guys. when you land in one of these cities, so if, I, if I'm if i touching this at all, I, I can replace it with a temple. And I pull this guy out, and I can put this temple anywhere on this island. And then at the end of each round, we're going to score... Who controls the island. Okay. So you get one point for every island you have at least one thing on. Can I knock a temple off the island? <laughs> you can try. <laughs> uh, there, there is one one of the, the classes that has this... Uh, it's the... I can't remember their name, but they have this guy that they get to flick. That's a massive ship. This thing will destroy a temple. No problem. Um Interesting. And yeah, so you get one point for everywhere you've got a guy, and you get two points for every guy that you have the most. And that's the whole game. So this sounds like a nice, light dexterity game. Yes. If you're trying to get into it. But then, where the fun and craziness comes in is we have these cards. And all of these cards are absolutely ridiculous. Um, And they determine either a rule for the round or a rule for the game. So we're going to flip two of these. And then this is going to be thumbs up. This is going to be thumbs down. We all are going to vote, and after we vote, one of these is going to come into play. So, as long as you have more than one profit, which is just one of the guys that you flick, you have to flick two profits using both hands at the same time. What? (laughs) So, they all just make it absolutely ridiculous. Some of them affect scoring. Some of them affect how you have to flick it. One of my favorites is there's one where you you get this ramp that you have to flick your disc off of. (laughs) This is nuts. It is easily one of the most fun games I've ever played. Interesting. And that's it. That's the whole game. Flick of Faith. Flick of Faith. Uh, Comes in at number three on your list. Yeah. It's it's super easy to teach. um, And you just 
I mean, I taught you how to play. You know how to play. Huh. And uh, that's it. I'm not mad. I've, I've played it so many times. Uh, we might have to try this one after this video. Yeah, I'm... <laughs> I'm down. This this is one of those few games that it doesn't matter what kind of mood I'm in. I will play this game. If you go, like, I could be in the mood to play Anachrony. And if you suggest Flick of Faith, I'll go, yeah, I could play Flick of Faith. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Nice, 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 nice. It looks fun. I, I can't complain about that one. I haven't played much Dexterity. I think the most I've played is Crokinole. Oh, I love Crokinole. Yeah. Crokinole so, almost made my list. Um, I just... It, well, first off, it's a very expensive board. It's... It, especially if you want a good one. Yeah. Especially if you want a good one. Like, I've looked into Crokinole boards. So, the first thing was, is like, oh, you're paying like $250, $400 for a Crokinole board. So, that's the problem one. Problem two is the size of the board and where you're going to store it. Yeah. Because it's, it's not fitting on one of these. No, I, I, I have a, I have a, I have a crokinole board that is, it's either A, set up all the time, or B, I do have a special place for it. Yeah. Um, I haven't found a special place for it yet. But it's... Nor have I found the... I do think crokinole is worth every penny. I haven't found the courage to tell the wife I'm, I want to buy a $400 board yet. I didn't tell mine. <laughs> <laughs> I just bought it. Oh. This is number three for you? This is my number three. It's a great game. It's Cascadia. And there's multiple reasons why I love this game. And it is, uh, you know, you're independently building your own habitat. I believe that's what it's called in this one. It's a little habitat. You're mm -hmm. drafting your tiles that are going to be your little hexagon to go place in your habitat. And you're also getting the animal tokens to go into there. And depending on what cards are coming out is how you score. So, like, there's four different cards for, I believe there's eagles, elk, bear, Fish and foxes, right? Those are the five ways to score points. Uh, every game is 20 rounds, I believe is what it is. And I don't remember. I think it's what it is. I, I just think... thought you set out the tiles yeah. and you go till they're gone. No, no, no. I believe it's 20 rounds. Sounds and, about uh, right. Yeah. And then after that, the game ends. You basically score up how many points you get. You get points for the largest continuous area. Mm -hmm. And then you get points for the best... At, the best job you did at scoring your animals based off of what card was selected at the end of the game. So this was high up on my list already. And then I found out that there was a solo variant in this thing. Mm. This is my most played solo game in my whole entire collection. Wow. I love this thing solo. It is basically, um, if you go into the back of the rule book, there is, I, the rule book should be on top. Let me just see. I believe there's like 15 or like 20 different uh, solo modes that you basically are trying to beat and it's, it's right here so it's achievements so you oh, wow. go through here and it tells you which one to set it up so like achieve achievement one all of your scoring tiles have to be a's and you have to beat 80 points and then it gets harder and harder and harder until you get all the way down to the bottom and like it gives you like four different winning criteria and you have to meet all four of them in order to get it so when it comes to like the solo one and you trying to achieve the benefits like hands down my most heavily played solo game mm. yeah i only have i only have one game in my whole collection that i ever play solo really only one game yeah so well if you're ever out there and you ever want a solo game and you want to like maybe dabble into solo like cast i love this game in solo mode and it's easy to set up it's basically you you draft one and then you throw away the one on the end can i ask if you've ever played Overboss. I haven't. So, I actually prefer Overboss to Cascadia, and I know people probably will think I'm crazy for that, but I really? think they're really the same game. Just rethemed? Uh, yeah. Um, and I believe Overboss came out first. That I, I, I don't know. Um, but Overboss is, it has the same system where you're taking a big tile and a small tile that mm -hmm. you have to place on the big tile. And, um... The, the biggest difference, and I, I think this is probably why Cascadia is uh, a more well-known and everything, is because Cascadia gives you that open-ended, you, you have no restrictions. Whereas Overboss, you have 12 spaces, and you're going to fill all of them, but you feel the constraint uh. of the board. Similar to like Calico, 
you, you, you yeah, know, you have that angst of like, if I put this here, if I'm I put screwed. this here, I'm screwed. Yeah, that's which you don't back. get that in Cascadia. Cascadia no. is, it feels a lot nicer for me. I I prefer Overboss, but like I I think Cascadia is is probably better for this list. Yeah, I, I it's, mean it's really good as far as the gateway game goes. Like it's super easy to teach. Like it's not complicated at all. And like I said, as far as gateway games go for solo gamers, like I, if you bought this one game, you could, you know, two, three check marks with one game. In this oh one. yeah. So like, I, th- I think this is one of those games that if you only own five games, yeah. this, this should be probably one of them. I love games where there's no downtime. Okay. And I think, you know, newer gamers really appreciate that as well. So do I. So for me, my number two is Space Space. Oh, back to back um, AIG games or yeah. AEG. Yeah, so Space Space. Um, if you've ever heard of Machi Koro, this is a similar system, but I think this just does it better in every single way. Okay. Um, what's what you're doing is you have the you have a board with twelve spaces on it, and those each have a card on it, and we all start the same, but we're all going to be way different by the end of it. Um, then you roll two dice. And everybody will activate their whatever number oh, is rolled. Okay. But this has a big a big change from Achikoro, which is if I roll a four and a five, you can activate your nine, or you can activate your four and your five. So all of the things that are higher than a six, all those cards are way better because mm. you have to combine the dice to get them. So you have there's like really like two strategies in this game. I mean, there's a lot of strategies, but you can put everything into these low cards that you're going to be able to activate all the time, but they're not going to be as good. Or you can get these crazy, there's like one of my favorite cards and I, I have still to do it, but there's a card in here. It's a 12. So there's only one way to roll it. Yeah. And it is, if you can get that card and you roll a 12, I think it's like five times you win. (laughs) What? You just win. But it, and the I've almost been able to do it because I was able to get a card that let me put that into a lower spot that let me move things around. But I the game starts so simple where we all have the same thing. I roll something, everyone gets something, and then we're building that up. And the cool thing about this game is when I buy a new number three, my old number, so you don't get my you don't get the number three on your board you get the number three that's off your board okay so when i buy a new number three my three comes off and tucks under my board and that is now the ability i get when someone else rolls a three so you are building up by the end of the game everyone is activating on everyone's turn so Every time. Th- this does sound a lot better than Machi Koro because I've played Machi You don't like before. Machi Koro. I do not like Machi Koro. I think Machi Koro is fine. It, I, um, this is... It drove me crazy. This, bl- this to me, blew Machi Koro out of the water. Okay. Like, it sounds much better. You I played this, I played right this game one time and gifted Machi Koro to a friend the next day. Um, I was like, I don't need watch Koro anymore. Space Space is so good. This is like the ridiculous edition with everything in it. Okay. The big box. and uh, But base game is just this small little box. It's yeah. super easy to teach. You just roll dice, get stuff. You're working up these tracks, and hmm. it's the first person with 40 points wins. And I'm going to play that. Yeah, I think we need to play a lot of these. Yes. Um, space Space. Space Space is great. My number two is a two-player game. This is my only two-player game on this whole entire list that I have. And the reason why it's on here is because I don't have much deck building. Like I said, I think the only thing I had on here was El Dorado was the only deck building game that I have. And I really, really love the deck building mechanic. And as far as like the deck building mechanic goes, this is one of the simplest deck builders you're going to be able to find. It's a head-to-head. So one of you is the good, you know, the raffles, and the other one's the dark side or the what are the the empire? They have so many different bad guys and stuff. I know. I... But uh, and then you have a, like an open market, and the market comes out. So there's going to be blue cards where you know only one side can buy. They get faced one way. Red cards go the other way. So depending on who you are, you're going to be able to buy. And then there's neutral cards. Mm-hmm. So the whole point is you're trying to blow up 
three of the worlds on of your opponent and you can either put like command ships you can block you can do some things on your turn you will play every single card of your hand you will get three things you will be able to get energy which is going to be in turn to be able to buy something from the market mm -hmm. you can get damage which you can assign to either a bad guy in the market or you can use to destroy some somebody's base okay or you can get i believe which is the force which moves you up this tug of war track that you guys are fighting up and whoever has the force on their side gets like bonus money gets bonus activation on cards if the force is with them they might get a special power up with them and uh, that's literally the game. Like, it's not hard. You basically, you can teach the game almost when you play it because of the fact that you play every single card. So you can just lay out your hand and let's walk through it. You get two energy here, you get two energy here, you get two damage. How are you going to spend it? Mm -hmm. Like, this is one of the easiest games to physically teach. The gameplay itself takes about 30 minute minutes. The only knock on this game is that it feels like the Rebels win almost every time. Okay. You have to be So a we very... should play it and I'll play the bad guys. <laughs> and we'll, and we'll, we'll fix that. I've only won with the Empire. I've only seen somebody win with it one time. And it's very hard because of the fact that uh, the Rebels start out with the Force. And some of the cards that the Rebels get just feel so overpowered. So like the only Emperor's move all the time is that if a card comes out in the market you have to destroy the card. So like the empire just feels like instead of you have to choose, do you go out and destroy a card or you go destroy a planet to try to win the game? Because the empire has more ways to like block damage. Like you're physically trying to figure out how to like prolong the game. So you can like find opportunities to go mm. and destroy, which is very like thematic. It's very good. It's this like chess game of like, Oh, what am I going to pull out now? What am I going to play? What am I going to be able to combo? And uh, as far as the game goes, like super easy to teach and probably one of my most played two player games in my whole entire collection. And I have I have quite a few two player only games. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. And uh, one of my, my, my by far most played and one of the easiest deck building games to teach. So, is you it your know, number one? You too? must know what my number one is. I don't know. Is it the same game? Oh, definitely I know what not. Uh, we my talked number... about, we. this is our only crossover actually. <laughs> but. Um. Yeah, I said I'd talk about it later. It's Marvel. It's Marvel United. Um. It's, it's a theme that most people like. Um. I think you'd be pretty hard pressed to find somebody that doesn't at least like a Marvel character. True. Um. And it's just, it's so streamlined. It's so simple that you can set it up, play it in twenty minutes, but. At the same time, there's so much, exp so many expansions and stuff for this game yeah. that there's another Kickstarter out right now. Yeah, I backed it. I got the all. <laughs> uh, I looked at it. it. Apparently, late pledge isn't open. Uh, well, yeah, I, I have it coming. You can play it when it comes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it, there's not really much I can say you didn't say, except for that when it comes to co-op. And I, when it comes to gateway and bringing people in the hobby, I think a lot of people have only ever played a game where you're going against each other. Um, mm, when, I, when you're new. Yeah, I guess a competitive game is normally what I think a lot of people going against the game is a new concept. And for me, when I was getting into the hobby, it was a really cool concept. I'm like, what do you mean? We, we're all working against the game. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I don't have to be a jerk to everybody and everyone hate me at the end of the night. Um, that's what usually happens. But yeah, it's, it's a co-op and it's super streamlined, super simple. It's got characters you love and the replayability in just one of these boxes is pretty great. Um, I think you can get this box for like 15 bucks on sale. Oh, really? Um, yeah, it's super cheap. I've seen it for as low as like ten bucks on Amazon hmm. every once in a while, and for ten bucks, this is steal. Yeah. Um, and then there's so much that you can expand it with. Uh, they have pretty much every character, so if you want to get your favorite character, yeah, you can probably find it. Yeah, there's a small box out there with. It might be on. Or... It might be on eBay for way too much money. 
because that's for everything that's that's how it is nowadays um but no it's a great game you get this box you get the base um x-men box you be playing for hours Th those two boxes together you they'll both fit in one box and you have like 15 heroes six villains and you you've got enough gameplay to last you hours upon hours yeah um of this, this great simple game you can play with kids. I think the best part is is you can mix and match heroes that normally shouldn't be together. Yeah. And now whether or, it's a good thing or a bad thing, like we did, it ended up being a bad thing, but that wasn't because of the heroes itself. It was probably because of the strength of the of the bad guy that we played with. Yeah. But like you just intermixing between, okay, I got two strong heroes. Let's go with a strong villain or, you know, let's go with a strong villain and let's just mix and match heroes and see what we get that don't play off each other well. And yeah. see if you can still beat the game. Like you can make the game as easy or as hard yeah. as you want it another, to be. Another another thing about that is, um, there's ways in here to make the game more difficult or more easy. Yeah. Um, beyond just which villain you choose and which heroes you choose, there's there's cards that you can take away to make it more difficult or. Yeah. Or there's locations that make the game easier, and there's just there's so much replayability in in this small box that, I mean, you really can't beat it for the price. No. Uh, if you can get this game for ten or fifteen bucks, I mean, it's it's some of the best money you'll spend in board gaming, I think. Okay, so you know my number one now. Yeah. That you've gotten through most of my list. Yep. You seem shocked by it. I. Let's just I will out. I will reserve my comments till after you explain. Okay. So, Seven Wonders, by far my most played game. I have played this on tournaments. I've played it online. I've played it at my house. I have all the, I have most of the expansions. Most of them shoved in here. I think I still have some over there. But I just Seven Wonders as a whole is probably just like my favorite game. Like I I love this one. I love Seven Wonders Duel. Duel is great. Duel is great. Like, I, I still think this one's a little bit easier to teach than Duel just because mm -hmm. of how you're stacking the cards and how you have to draft. It's a little bit more cutthroat. Uh, but this one, when you have closed drafting and I, I get to select my card and then we get to pass it to the left. And so you know what's going to come back to you after a while. You get There's just so many choices. Uh, your asymmetric, I guess, player starting power, which is just your, your, your resource. Board. Yeah, your board. It's not really like a power of anything. But uh, but the expansions bring in a whole new world to this thing if you've only played the base game. Like, some of the expansions make this game great as well. Like, just continue to add to, like, the greatness of Seven Wonders. And not to mention, like, I love, like, the theme of Seven Wonders. I love just... This is what, like, I like. Like, the theme that, like, really attracts me to board games and stuff like that. If I was going to say a theme, like, this is probably one of them. Like the Wonders? Yeah, like the Wonders, the like, Egypts, yeah. the older, yeah. you know, the older European area. Like, all of this type of stuff that really uh, intrigues me. So, like, there, there's a lot going on. Now, I'm, he's probably going to tell me it's, like, too hard to teach somebody or it's going to be too difficult there's only so many things that you can do with your cards. And there's only so many ways that you're going to be able to score points. And once anybody grasps like what you're doing, like, oh, I get resources. Those resources are used to buy this or those resources are used to buy this. Like the game can flow and the game is fast enough that you can use the first game as a teaching game. And by the time you're done with the first game, Somebody is going to know how to play Seven Wonders. Somebody. Maybe anyway. not everybody. I still think everybody. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, I, for me, this one didn't make my list. Uh, I love Seven Wonders. Yeah. I've played it... Yeah, same. I've played it in a bunch of tournaments. Um, played it a bunch of game nights. It's, it was a nightcap for a lot of, a lot of game nights. Yeah. Um, Go-to game to play with seven people if I didn't want to play a party game. Yes. Um, that has been replaced for me by a different game. Really? Uh, yeah. Um, but, um, I'll, I'll tell you, but the, uh, for me, I think Seven Wonders is harder than us as gamers think it is to grasp. Um, like for me, it's, it makes so much sense, but I've taught it to enough people that have struggled with it 
that I stopped using it as an intro game. So I once they've played Marvel United or any of these other games, once their their game repertoire is more than Yahtzee and Pictionary, yeah. once they've played something else, I'll I'll tell teach them Seven Wonders. But this would not be my my first game teaching somebody that has never played a hobby board game. I think it's got plus they're gonna get smoked unless I purposely play bad. Okay. And and that feels bad to I get guess, smoked. Uh, it does feel <laughs> bad to lose. I, I'm not I'm not gonna get you're not wrong. <laughs> you will lose a lot. And but the games are quick enough that I guess the way I see it is that the I game, think it's a great pick. I, the game is fun. The game is easy to learn. I think where it comes is it's hard to master. That's true. And even after I've played this thing like two, three, I don't know how many times. Like I've played it a lot. Like I still get my butt whooped. Like it's not like it's it's a, a walk in the park for me after how many plays. It's still going to be difficult. It depends on what card you take. Depends on what plan you're trying to take. The reason why I enjoy it is because no matter how the person plays, they're not going to play it wrong. They're, it's, it's an easy game to pick up, Almost but a very like hard to all game. The science. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can go after science and you can try to win that way, but somebody might destroy you with military and find a way to get there. Like, there's other ways to win besides the science. No, but I mean, if, if yeah. someone's not playing and they don't see the value of it yeah, and true. they let one person get all of it, you're yeah. game over. True. Good, yep. good luck. Um, but, but that's why I'm saying, like, it's one of those games that's like, chess to me so like if you have like chess players out, out there like that know the game is easy to learn but hard to master like this is one of the uh, this is why like i still keep coming back to it because no matter how many times i play it like i'm not going to win every single time and i'm still trying to do other things your gameplay changes based off what cards you get in your hand and what you choose to do it changes based off of your starting resource that you get or what uh wonders that you're trying to actually build to get bonuses like there's so many things that go into it and but it doesn't have to be heavy it doesn't have to be like a big ordeal at the beginning when you're trying to teach somebody how to get mm -hmm. into it like the game can be light-hearted and easy to teach no it's a good game i i, I love it i have very few games in my collection that play six or more people well that are not a party game that's still one of them my go-to now is a game called The Great Split. Oh, you were telling me about that. Um, it's awesome. It's I Cut You Choose, which is a mechanic I think is underutilized in the hobby. Yeah, I really um, do. There's I not very many games I, that use it. No, I, I love that mechanic. And it's great. We'll, we'll play it. I don't think if it's your favorite game, I don't think it'll beat it for you. Mm -hmm. But I think you'll see the, the greatness of the game and how easy it is to, to teach. So... Well, I'm excited. Yeah. All right. Well, that's our top 10. Yeah. Gateway games. That was a mouthful of games <laughs> that we got to go through. I, I'm surprised we only have one crossover. I know. I can't believe it. It sounds like uh, you need to play some of these games. You need to play more I know. games. I, there's a couple on I there. I think we I have like five or six try. on each list that we hadn't played yet. Yeah. That's crazy. And we have a lot of games under our belt. Yeah. I've played... Probably somewhere around 400 yeah. unique games. I, so. I just looked up my list the other day. I think I just crossed 300 a few months back of yeah. unique games. Yeah. And that's crazy that we still have that many in our top 10 that we haven't played. Yeah, I know. It's, there's so many. I know. There, there's so many ridiculous. games. There, It's impossible to play all of them. You know, you, you play what you can. Yeah. So. Exactly. All right. Well, that's our video. We got to uh, make sure to put your uh, barn made games. Yeah. Plug it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm Isaac. Uh, we just started a company called Barn Made Games. We'll be putting out our first game. Uh, it's called Expressions. This is just a prototype right now. The, uh, the finals are on their way. But it's actually funny enough that when we were going through this list, I, I had added that game to my while well, I was ranking and it ended up my number one <laughs> um it's a and, really and, good game and it was not me being selfish like oh it's mine I gotta pick it I was actually genuinely like no I think this game is is that good and I know it probably would have made your it, top 10 it, it had you had it in your in I your didn't ranking. put it in mine um, I told him no I wasn't gonna put <laughs> it's, it in it's not out yet it's a really good game 
Um, if you like Hanabi or um, the game, those no the those, mind. the well the game as well. Oh, there's there's a game called the game. There's a game called the game. <laughs> uh, just that co-op deduction. Um, it's very very simple and easy to teach, but there's a lot of depth yeah. in in what you can and can't tell each other. So um, we will put the link. Yeah, we'll put, in we'll put the, the link. You below. can uh, you can check it out. Yeah, you can reserve a copy on our website right now. It's not a pre order, but if you just enter your email right there, we'll make sure that you get one of the copies when they're available. We're shooting for uh, like a February release, and then we've got another game coming out, uh, going to Kickstarter in March. So effortless, it, effortless, yeah. So keep your eyes out. We're uh, we're going to be doing some big things. So You have the notification page on Kickstarter up yet? Yeah, you can uh, check Effortless out on Kickstarter. If we you... will put that link into the description below as well if you're interested in that. Yeah, if you go to our website, all, all that info is there as well. So. Yeah, we'll put both. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well. Might as well. <laughs> Make it easier for you. Yeah. So. so, well, that is Isaac from Barn Made Games. I am Armando from Between Two Meeples, and I hope you enjoyed the video. We will see you soon. Yep, sounds good. All right.